Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. Today, we continue our series on counterparty risk management. In the previous episodes, we dove into what counterparty risk is, why it requires close management, and the sources of such a risk. In the episode of today, expect to learn what due diligence is and its importance in counterparty risk management, how to run a proper pre-trade assessment and what that is, what a credit risk assessment is and the role of rating agencies, and much more. Like always, we really hope you will enjoy this episode. If that is the case, why not leave us a review? Reviews are definitely the best way to help us since the algorithm then push forward our podcast on the different platforms. On top of that, it makes us and I very happy and it is completely free. With all that being said, uh, let's get on with the show. How can you take those steps? What are the steps? I'm going to start by the obvious, uh, but a good way to mitigate counterparty risk is to, well, pay attention to whom you are dealing with and where does your money come from. An excellent way to do so is by doing what we call a pre-trade assessment. Okay, what's, what's a pre-trade assessment then? You may have heard about due diligence. Is it something that's reasonable? Yeah. Or also? Indeed, so, a lawyer chat, right? It's a exactly. of a lawyer term from our favorite TV show, Suits, Guillaume. That's well, exactly. Harvey and Mike do a lot of due diligence. Spot yeah. on. Harvey and so, well, Mike. Yeah, exactly. So, what is due diligence? It's basically a comprehensive and systematic investigation of potential investment or product to confirm all facts. This is very lawyery uh, jargon as well. I'm figuring out. So, reviewing all the financial records and contracts, uh, all the financial statements of the counterparty you're dealing with. Uh, the credit rating, for instance, if it has one. All this is due diligence. And the purpose is to assess the risks and opportunities, of course, associated with a proposed transaction or a proposed transaction with a certain counterparty and verify that all material information have been disclosed. If not, so, you are not sure what you are stepping into. So it's basically just making sure you've done your homework, right? It's just... 100%. Going it was a fancy all... way to say that. <laughs> so doing all your research, delving into all the things that could be important when mm -hmm. dealing with this other company that you're about to deal with, right? So looking yes. into there, have they paid other people on time in the past? Um, do they have, do they pay their credit cards off correctly? Um, are they trustworthy? But also legally, are they set up correctly? Is there anything shady going on? These kind of things, right? It's just making sure you do your checks and get that done properly. Spot on, indeed. Okay. Yeah. Well, give me, talk me through an example about the kind of things you would check before you go into some sort of transaction. 100%. So let's take M&A, mergers and acquisitions, for instance. Let's say that Hussam's Cafe uh, wants to buy a coffee chain in South America to expand its business here, which is amazing because it's literally the land of coffee, right? If or hands, it is not absurd to state that you will make sure the financial and operational status of the company you are buying are as they are sold and told about, right? Uh, you will probably be chatting with the CEO or like the head of merger and acquisition of this big coffee chain in South America. And they say, yeah, our company is fantastic. We have amazing results and so on. But you want to actually have a look at it on paper. What does it say? And you want to make sure there is nothing hidden, like a big debt to be repaid that will lower the price of the company, for instance, or some fine to be paid and so on. What you want to do is not to overpay the company you are acquiring. It would be the same if you decide to make an investment uh, before giving your money to a hedge fund, for instance, or to a bank. So it invests your money for you. You want to make sure that this hedge fund is robust enough and will be able to give you your money back in the case you decide to exit with hopefully some interest, of course. Okay. So it's basically not taking the CEO, the person that's selling their company to me on their word, but actually getting everything checked. Like if they say, oh, we have this many branches, checking that we have, they have this many branches. If they say, yeah. oh, we have this much in uh, revenue, 
looking through their accounts and making sure they actually have that much in revenue, exactly. et cetera, et cetera, right? So where does, I feel like this ties quite closely to compliance overall, Indeed. right? As a, as a concept. So um, I know, especially usually you have banks helping you finance these deals. Banks are all about compliance. Um, does that, how does that tie into all of this? hundred um, percent. Again, you're spot on my Sam. Compliance and regulation constitutes like an investigation performed to ensure that a company or individual is in compliance with relevant laws and regulation, of course. So you may have heard of as well as anti-monitoring, money laundering, sorry, AML, or know your customer KYC regulations. That's something that is really known and talked about in the financial world, in the banking world, and in the fintech world, actually. So for banks, compliance, and especially KYC, has become a critical part of the dealing process. Again, there's that kind of like due diligence on the compliance and legal side? Is that what it is? Exactly. And it's part, again, of the pre-trade ass assessment. So you don't only want to check the financial aspects of a company, right? You also want to make sure they are always compliant with the law. Uh, they are not doing anything shady because first, there is a risk of reputation for you, uh, but that's something else. But there is also, okay, if tomorrow they need to close the company because they just made a huge illegal thing and they owe you money, well, you're unlikely to get your money back. So it's all part of this, the due diligence, KYC, and compliance aspects. We also find uh, what we quickly touched upon earlier in the supply chain finance series, the credit risk assessment um, of it. So this is a process used to evaluate the likelihood of a borrower defaulting on a loan or meeting their contractual obligations. So this is a bit beyond the compliance aspect. It's then, okay, what is their credit risk? And the assessment is typically performed by lenders, financial institutions, and rating agencies. Okay, so Guillaume, take me into the, the technical details. How does one run a proper credit risk assessment then? By all means. So it all starts with the collection of data. Obviously, the collecting data on the borrower, including the financial information, credit history, and other relevant information on the business. For instance, is it used to repay on time? Are the suppliers currently getting their money on time according to the payment terms? Um, do they not do anything shady? Are they compliant with the law? And so on. You then obviously need to run an analysis on financial information, right? You analyze the borrower's financial statements, income statement, balance sheets, uh, and their ability to repay loans in full and on time. Then you can have a look at their credit history, uh, which is a review of the borrower's credit history, including past loans and payment behavior. And potentially, there are the evaluation of other factors, such as the borrower's industry. Uh, some are more risky than others. You named it earlier, the number of branches uh, that the counterparty is telling they have, the economic environment as well. Uh, maybe some industries are much more subject to be impacted by economic environment where others are not. Uh, the case of the pandemic, for instance, the tech and digital industry has been way less affected or actually in a positive manner than others. Um, and the uh, collateral available to secure the loan, for instance, if you are thinking of granting a loan. Last but not least, you determine the credit score. So this is either done by the rating agency or you do it yourself. And it's based on the information gathered. The lender or credit agency assigns a credit score to the borrower, which reflects their credit worthiness. That was a, a big chunk. Does it make all sense? So you collect all the data about... Mm -hmm how they've borrowed in the past, how well they've sold it off, uh, sorry, paid it back, et cetera, right? Yeah. You just sort of go through all their statements to make sure that they're profitable and they have they actually make money so they would be able to pay you back. Yes. And then you just kind of look at, you know, other factors such as are they in a risky country? Is the industry tanking in general, et cetera? So basically, it's a combination of mm -hmm. their overall history, their history of borrowing, and the environment in which they are at the moment and how the future looks for that environment, right? So those are the kind of things exactly. that you would look to to see if they're a good credit risk or not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what is that what the agency does then, the rating agencies that we mentioned in the past? What's their, are they the ones that run this calculation and assessment or? Exactly. So getting a credit rating from one of those uh, rating agencies, so we can think about Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and so on. Those are the biggest. 
you need to pay it as a company to say, okay, we would like a credit rating because we intend on making some financial transactions or be acting on the on the market and so on. Or banks do that themselves. But in the case of rating agencies, their role uh, is to, well, run the credit risk assessment process and to provide independent and objective credit ratings for various debt and securities or companies. These ratings serve as benchmark for the credit risk of an insurer, uh, of an insurer, sorry, and can help investors make informed investment decisions or as a company to say, ah, okay, this company is rated triple A, whatever. Um, it's a trustworthy company. I can deal with it. So the credit ratings assigned by rating agencies can also affect a borrower's ability to access financing as lenders may require a minimum credit rating for a loan to be approved and so on. And to quickly touch upon this, there are some grids available online, but basically uh, you want a counterparty containing a lot of A's in the credit score. You might have heard uh, the name of triple A uh, when talking about certain financial products or institutions. The more A's, the better, basically. I mean, I've only heard of this in this situation of the financial crisis in 2008. <laughs> Which makes sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it will be the same. Uh, you want to deal with a company that is rated as many A as possible as you would for the financial products you contract. It's just a score as a way of rating everything we already talked about and summarized around the um, counterparty risk, right? So you do that assessment yeah. and then you can't just come up with like a score, an arbitrary score to define whether where people rank on the assessment you've done, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 